All right, how's everybody doing tonight? We doing good? I heard one great. At least there is one great. For the rest of you, I hope you get there. <laughs> well, we are going to be in um, Exodus chapter, well, basically one. Yeah, basically one, even though I said we might be further. But I told you that's okay. So anyway, uh, Exodus chapter one, if you're there, I'll do a little bit of a brief overview just to catch us back up. Try to do that very quickly, not to, not to bore us, just to remind us what we just went over. So we're all on the same page, and uh, we'll, we'll do that in, into chapter 2 this evening. Um, we are in Exodus, Sundays and Wednesdays, in case uh, you thought you stepped into the wrong class uh, for this quarter. We're all in here together. I'm excited about that. Uh, my family will unfortunately um, be um, missing in action uh, Sunday, uh, so Brent will be up here with you. Uh, we have to um, go, not have to, that sounded bad. We are going to uh, hold a, a gospel meeting um, for a church family in um, East Texas. And so we'll, we'll be gone this Sunday and returning back uh, the following Sunday. So you'll be in good hands with Brent um, as you continue studying through. I will try to do my best uh, to let you know what class is coming up next since I said that there's no book, but I know you'll, you'll want to be looking through your Bible and reading and getting yourself familiar. So we'll try to do that. Uh, one and two is my goal tonight, and three and four, give or take, uh, for Sunday with Brent. So that's, that's the goal. But before we get into our scripture, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer, all right? Father God, we are so grateful that we can be here tonight with our family. It's so encouraging just to see each other and shake each other's hands and hug each other and to know that we're all going through life and, and its trials, but we're all doing it together. And we're doing it with our eyes set on you. And we're so grateful that we can come to this place and kind of just take this time to, to put the world and the things we have to do outside and focus our hearts on you. We, we love this opportunity and, and we are so thankful to you that you have given it to us tonight. And we pray, Father, that those that are in our family that are unable to be with us tonight, that want to so badly, we pray, Father, that you would bring, us, bring them back to us, give them their health that they desire and that we desire for them. And we just pray that we'll have so many more opportunities to learn um, from your word and learn about you uh, before you call us home. We love you so much, and we thank you for this time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. We started in uh, a little bit of an introduction, kind of uh, who wrote, when it was written, why that matters, what some other people like to say to try to prove the Bible is inaccurate. And then we started just briefly, and it was good that we got where we did, honestly, in chapter 1. Uh, through those first seven verses, and we just looked at uh, Joseph and how he's dying, and then there was one Pharaoh, or I like to say king, because I just think that's important to keep reiterating. Some people can think that Pharaoh is a name, not a name, a title. So the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, um, passes as well, and we have a new one in power, and that gives us kind of where we were leaving off, and so we'll get into that here in just a few minutes. What I want to do with you tonight is I want to kind of eat at it in chunks, right? So we're going to read. I'm going to ask some of you to help me in that reading, and then we're just going to break it down and, and get into each and every one. So I want to look at themes with you tonight. I'm going to try to do that a lot in this quarter. Um, try to, instead of like dissecting every word and every verse, what I want you to see is, is kind of the whole forest, kind of like I said in our last time. I don't want you to just go through and say, yeah, I've heard that story before, uh, before, heard that story before, and just walk away with just stories being reminded of that. No, I want you to see what God is trying to teach us. Knowledge without application is nothing. If, if we know about God, we know about how he worked with his people throughout time, but we don't know what the expectation is for us, then really what's the purpose of reading the scriptures? When we read and we dive in and dig in, we're supposed to be seeing ourselves in that story. doesn't matter if it's thousands of years ago or 2023. The Bible is given to us, yes, as history, but not just history. We're, we're not just supposed to gather together and make sure we know all the stories and the timelines. We're supposed to know how God is working and how he's working for you and for me today in our lives. So that's what we want to do. Well, let's go ahead and begin and kick this off. Um, we were, we've already gone through verses 1 through 7. 
And now let's kind of go in 8 and 10 um, very quickly. We already kind of covered that, so just as a, a context, can somebody read verses 8 through 10 of Exodus chapter 1? There was a word. Uh, what translation are you using, brother? New International. Um, so there's, there's a word that I liked in there. Um, verse 10. Come, let us deal what? Shrewdly. Okay. So a part of reading through Exodus, I've kind of mentioned this before, but I'm going to try to help us um, continue to unfold it. What we're reading here is an extension of Genesis. What we've already learned in Genesis, we're supposed to keep bringing that forward. And here's what I want you to think about. I wasn't here for your Genesis. Sorry, I couldn't say that then. But I can say it now. As you read your Bibles, here's what I want to challenge you to do when you're at home and reading some other book and chapter besides Exodus. Try to look as you're reading who is or where is the Lord in every story. Where is the serpent and where is man and what is he doing? You said deals what? Hmm. Anybody else know another story where somebody deals shrewdly with humans? The serpent, the Garden of Eden. See what hasn't? Crafty, shrewdly, wisely. And, and the whole thing is, in the Bible, is the garden is the standard and it gets repeated time and time and time again. Try to look for that when you're looking through your Bibles. Where is the garden scene being redone? Why? Not just because it's cool to look at themes, because we're supposed to be learning something from it. But what do we know about people? Are we overall, are we smart or not so much when it comes to following God? What do you think? Not so much. The second one. And so we should look at these stories and learn, but... We have troubles, but we're still learning. We're still trying to grow, okay? So Pharaoh is the serpent, and he is all throughout this storyline. The Pharaoh is the serpent in this story of the Garden of Eden, and what does he try to do? Well, he tries to do some things to God's people, and why? Because what does he feel about the people? They're, how are his, the slaves a threat? Somebody answer that for me. There's so many of them, we talked about this a little bit, and I have those scriptures now for you on the screen. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 37 says over 600,000, and then we get the exact number in 3826. So we've already had this discussion Sunday morning, you do some math and you got 1.2, probably more than that, probably like 2 million or more Israelites. So why does he fear them? It's just it's a numbers game. And you don't need your slaves start getting to a number where perhaps they can try to connect with another nation and then the Israelites and another nation come in to destroy, destroy his kingdom, all right? So what is he going to do about it? Well, let's read about that and see some things that he does and make some connections to that as well. Yes, sir? I don't think they were slaves at that time. When? At this point, it's after Pharaoh dies. He said, verse 6, Joseph dies and all of his brothers. A new king arose who did not know. So even if they're not slaves, you don't think they're slaves? Anybody have any thoughts on that either way? Ever thought about that? Are they slaves at this point or are they just getting nervous about it? Good. Uh huh. That's right. Let's do this. Sure. But what can we do? I could buy that. Sure. I could buy that. Whether they are or he's saying, let's make a plan. And that's what we're going to do, right? Either way, that they're going to end up there. Because yeah, he didn't want them to join with any enemies. Any enemies, that's right. Because there's a lot of them. Yeah, and uh, that happens a lot through history. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
do something, making making things of war, right? About it, yes, ma'am. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I like that. I like it. So appointed taskmasters over, perhaps is letting us know that not yet, but that's the plan, and we want to make sure that that's taken care of. I can buy it. I can buy it. Well, let's talk about now that they are, uh, let's talk about what Pharaoh's going to do um, about that. Uh, uh, let's break that down. Tell you what, can somebody read verses 11 through 14? 11 through 14. All right, so what are we doing? We have three attempts to oppress them. What's the first one? Verse 11. What are they doing? Storehouses. Uh, what, what does your scripture say specifically? I'd be interested in different versions in verse 11. What does it say that he's doing to them? Forced labor. Okay. All right, I have afflict. Anybody have anything else? Oppressed. Okay. So the first thing that he wants to do is oppress them, control them, afflict them. Whatever he can do, it's control over them, right? So that they can build his cities and build his monuments and things of that nature. All right, let's keep going because of that. Um, verse 15, let's go 15 through 20. 15 through 20, somebody. So we have two stories that are going to start to melt together here. First, afflict. I want to point something out that will help us connect all the 15 through 20. There's something I think is very important in verse 12. And it also goes with our next story. Pharaoh, the serpent in the story, he tries to deal wisely, shrewdly oppress humans. But what does God do in verse 12? He blesses them. I wonder if there's any connections to that, um, 2023. What do you think? <laughs> I want to hear about it. If there's connections, what is it? Let's make sure we're just not like saying yes, but we take away the applications for us. Yes, sir. So what happens when the serpent tries to himself or use somebody else to oppress the word of God? Does it ever work? You can say, well, people are oppressed, enemies win, but does it ever actually work? Emphatically, no. In, in fact, what almost always happens immediately or in time, in God's timing, after some oppression, is that faith grows, more people become followers, or people that were not followers, they fear, they become followers. And so the first thing we see is affliction, but yet they keep multiplying. And then, but the serpent, the Pharaoh, right, he says, 
Well, here, maybe we'll try this. What is his second attempt here in verses 15 through 20? What's he doing here? Killing, attempting to kill. Okay. But it didn't happen, and why? This one's going to be fun. I'm excited about this one. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about who the wrong people are because I think that's very important to the overall story. Uh, he went to the people who were dedicated. Okay. Okay, now, they were people that were supposed to be helping, but looking at the context, do we see or believe that they are Hebrews or are they Egyptians? What do you think? The ladies that are helping, are they Hebrews? Are they Egyptian? Yes. <laughs> what? What? All right, okay. So we got to the Hebrew midwives. They're coming in, and so those are the right people. That's what we need to see. Who they are, why they would be dedicated, but can you ever now, as New Testament Christians, know that you're a Christian, know what you should do, but make the wrong choice because you're fearful of whatever, money, job, other people? Is that a possibility? Sure. What we read about these people, though, is that these ladies were people that went ahead and continued to follow no matter what, and that is so important. So he tries... But he can't. Why? Why can't he? What is, what is their excuse for why they couldn't fulfill their job? Is that it their excuse, though? Is it, that's, that's the factual reason. But what did they say to Pharaoh? <laughs> well, indeed, tell me, what does vigorous mean, brother? I like your language there. Sure. I, I didn't say that. I want everybody to know. I didn't say any of that. That's right. They can. They're strong people. And you said, listen, uh, Pharaoh, it's not our fault. We were trying to uphold your orders, but these are ladies that didn't need our help, or they, they were able to have their children so fast get back on their feet. What, what are we going to do? Um, Did they lie? I, what, what do you think? Did they lie? Then does he approve of lying? Well, why not? It said that they're wonderful people and they feared God and they're blessed by him. What do you think they did? They did not. Is it possible? I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Now, if you hold a different one, I'm not going to argue with you. I don't see how it's not a lie. Even if it's one of those where it's true, but it's like teaching our children, yeah, you kind of arrange that as a truth, but you knew. I don't see how it's not at least some, some misleading, because that's the storyline. Why else would we need the story? The story is, there's some Hebrews. They were told to uphold a task. But verse 21 because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. They feared, and so therefore, they kind of attempted to not do it. So again, um, does God approve of lying? I had a no. Yes, sir. Okay, same. Same. They're, they're not here. I don't know where they're at, even though they're... Okay. Yes, sir. Please. Absolutely. Sure. Yes. 
Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Yep. Good passion. I 100% agree. I'm with all of you, but I don't think it's healthy at all for the Bible class teacher to stand up in front and just say, this is what I think and you should think it too. The purpose is to grow in knowledge and push ourselves on, hang on, kind of seems like he's rewarding lying here. He's not rewarding lying. He's rewarding verse 21. Because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. Don't look at your scriptures and say, so like this whole black and white, right, wrong. There's not a single person in history outside of Jesus, the Son of God, that is perfect without sin. Are we saved tonight? Are, are we saved? Are any of you perfect? The point there is, it's not, well, God is okay with lying. It's God's grace covers people when they fear him, even in their imperfections. It's about fearing him, following him, and being wise as, when you live in a fallen world. Yes, Al? Hmm. Yes, there is. Of course there is. There's absolutely a theme that connects to what Brent brought out that they're going to act shrewdly, you know, the serpents, the ones working with the serpent, but we're also supposed to be. We don't just take it lying down. And a lot of people look at, at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and say, turn the other cheek and then we, can, we should never say anything, never do anything. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, stand up for yourself, but you're not supposed to be looking for evil and trying to fight and always take up for yourself. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. That doesn't mean we're doing nothing. We're not acting shrewdly and in, in working through the situation to fear the Lord and to follow him, right? And so the first thing is, we're going to put them in bondage. We're going to make them our workers. Number two, well, let's tell the, the, the midwives to try to kill them. That doesn't work either, so verse 22, Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. So another attempt, just start throwing them into the Nile. What, whatever it is we can do, let's do that, okay? Interesting concept. I bring back up verse 11. They afflicted. Verse 12, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out. As you said a minute ago, when Satan tries to oppress, God comes over the top and he always wins. And he wins this time by, you're trying to kill children, I'm going to bring a deliverer that will do great things and show the power of Yahweh. Do you have a comment? Yeah, Jacob. Yeah, he does a lot wrong. He lies. But yet he still blesses him with riches from Egypt. Does it mean it's, it's about perfection? Well, it, it just means God is going to take care of his purposes. That's right. He wanted Abraham to be the father of a nation. He wanted to give him land That's so right. that the seed could come and bless all nations. Yeah. Did, did something wrong. Or outside forces tried to do something to Abraham. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 he kept growing. He kept, his herds get bigger. Yeah. 
All he needs from us is a willing heart to put him first. That's all he needs. That's all he needed out of the disciples. He didn't need perfection. He didn't need intelligent men, people with a lot of money. He just needs a willing heart. Yes, sir, go ahead. And then, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then it replays again. When do we see a serpent trying to kill the seed? That's, that's the point, that it's not, oh, there's a story, and we can teach it to the kids, and so on and so forth. It's, if we can catch these reoccurring themes, then what we can do is say, what, what it, what's going on in my life? Who is trying to tempt me? How, who is the serpent using in my life? What am I giving in to? Am I allowing him to win in my life? Am I following myself and what I want? Or am I following what Jesus wants? Because it's the same. There, there's nothing new. And to be quite honest with you, the serpent does not have to try that hard in our lives. He just doesn't. It's not like he has to recreate the wheel. He does the same thing, and I'll bring that up um, here a little bit later, about what he did in the garden that he keeps doing now. Same thing. John, do you have a comment? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yes. 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 That's right. And we see it even the first two chapters of the Bible. Where are the events occurring? In a what? In a garden. What's at the end of Revelation? A garden. The new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. And it's the garden with the rivers. The whole Bible is one story that leads to Jesus that allows us to see God created everything in perfection. We failed, but he will not fail us. And as long as we stick with him, He's going to recreate the garden, and we will live in a garden atmosphere, Garden of Eden, forever. That's the theme that we're seeing. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> sure. So keep going with that money, with that with that amount. Exactly. But, or are we, are we only learning about two? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, sure. Sure. Either way, it, it, it speaks to how many, how many there were, right? <laughs> I mean, it, but, but again, you, you watch your history channel at home or whatever that is, then they talk about this story, and please, Please, brethren, 
Don't watch your history channels about the Exodus and Genesis and think that they're, they're telling you everything and be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Well, you didn't know it because most of the time it's not in the Bible. That's just a side note. I'm off my soapbox. Um, they would say, oh, maybe a few hundred thousand, maybe something, 500,000, maybe max. And no, you look at that and you, you do the math and we're, we're talking in the millions. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, it is. A term. Absolutely. And, and also, uh, uh, something that I've learned over the years is um, when reading through the scriptures, a lot of the times when you read certain things, it's not necessarily just giving you just that. There's so many metaphors, right, that, that are in the scriptures that are, that are describing so much more. So, um, you know, whether it is, and even if it's the... I, I feel like there would be more, but you don't have to agree with me. Yes, yes, sir. It seems to be the deeper two that would touch the Hebrew audience to say that. Sure. You wouldn't bring all the Hebrews to your class. No, he's not going to allow that. Yeah. You, nobody just strolls up in to talk well, to the Pharaoh. The leading ladies of sure. All the men wives, Absolutely. They were supposed to go back and share this message. Yes. And then because they were the leaders, they sure. were the ones that were called back. Sure. Well, I mean, if you want to go down that path, it, well, never mind. I won't do that. That's, that's for another, another time. That's a private conversation. We'll, we'll, we'll let that. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. So that brings us to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Because if you know that you wake up and somebody tells you what to do, are you aware that you're in bondage? Here, I'll, I'll use something that, uh, that Allie showed uh, me this morning, so thank you. It would be much better if I had the chains like the, the gentleman had. But uh, another preacher was showing something like this he was saying that we don't realize what bondage looks like because he said if you had a chain and think about a, a big chain that you would use like pull something you know on the farm if satan just walked up to you and said here's what i want from you steve i, I want to put this around your neck and now i'm gonna you're gonna be in chain to me would you ever say yes no. But what if, what if, back to Jennifer's point, that what if Satan gave you one link of the chain? Would that seem as big of a deal to you? Well, it wouldn't because I know that every single one of us in this room, including myself as the chief, what we do is we make excuses with things in our lives and our sins and we say, well, that's just one little chink. I'm, I'm still Jesus's, but this is just one little thing that I want in my life. One little sin, one little thing that's mine. And then what we do is we take that chain, and then next week we have another chain. And, they're like, and then by six months later, we have a chain this long. A year later, a chain this big. And it's just those small decisions that we've made over time. And then we take the chain, and we put it around ourselves. And do you realize what's happening there? He didn't build the chain. He didn't put it around your neck. Who built the chain of sin around your neck or your soul? We did. He doesn't have to build it for us. He just gives us some opportunities and we sign up and say, sure. And then every time we say sure, we make the chain stronger and longer and we chain ourselves to the serpent instead of our Savior and our Creator. How sad is that? That's the theme. Enslavement. It goes back to the garden. Do you want freedom? I'll give it to you. You just can't eat of that one tree. You eat of the one tree. And here's the side note, since we're already side noting. It's okay. If it helps us and encourages us, it's worth it. How many times has something happened in your life and you said, that's not fair? 
How many times in life has something happened to somebody else and you've either said or at least thought it, where is God in that? Aren't we his children? Here's the problem. Here's where the enslavement comes. In the garden, they had every tree. They had everything. They took the one thing and then was like, what's going on here? Likewise, what we do, God gives us, you know, salvation, eternal hope, eternal life, knowing that whatever happens to you on this earth will never happen to you again once you're in his presence because you're in his presence and you have eternal life. And then for some reason we will take millions upon millions of daily blessings such as just breathing and getting up in the morning and then one thing will happen and we'll say, God, where are you? The one thing. What would you say to your children if you fed them, clothed them, gave them a place, got toys out, you know, coming out of the, the room and they came to you and said, Mom and Dad, I didn't get the one toy I wanted for Christmas. What would you say to them? That's right. Life's not fair. And what else? Hopefully that's as far as it goes. Maybe more. Because we see in our children that I'm giving you everything. I'm sacrificing my money, my time. You didn't get one thing and you're mad at me? Don't forget to turn that back around on yourself. Because we do the same thing. And that's when Satan uses the enslavement to say, God doesn't love you. God doesn't need you. You don't need him. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, let's take that back to the garden. Because the way that we'll word that is, can you believe it? Husband, wife started cheating on the marriage. How dare they? I thought they were Christians. Hang on. What was the husband doing? Was the husband at home? Was he paying any attention? Was he being a godly husband? Was he following the example that we see? It's the small choices. We blame the wrong people. I don't know, maybe like the garden. Eve takes it. And what does she say? Say, so, yeah, serpent did it. Serpent made me do it. And then we talk to Adam, and it's Adam talks to the creator, and what does he say? This woman that you gave me, she's the one who did it. You got to blame it on somebody. But it's all because we have chosen the little pieces of the chain and it's our fault. It's our insecurities, our bad decisions, our lack of being dedicated to our Creator. And we try to say, well, it's my job's fault. It's the bank account's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's the children's fault. No, it's not. We make decisions whether we want to put the Lord first or not. Do we want to put Him first or do we want to put Ball first? We want to put the Lord first. Or happiness with the kids. Lord or our kids being popular. The Lord first or some trip. The Lord first or whatever. You get where we're going. And it's those small things that teach our wife or our husbands or our children who is first. You would say, well listen, I'm doing it for their good and their happiness. And I would say, their happiness comes from peace in the Lord, not in everything else. The Pharaoh is clearly a serpent 
that is trying to enslave these people, and it's all because of what we already said. The serpent knows what's coming. He knows somebody's coming to crush his head, and he thinks this might be it. He has some idea of what's going on here, and he has to snuff it out. But it's those that were not perfect. They were liars, I think. You can disagree. I think that they may have fibbed a little bit, but that wasn't the point. The point was they feared the Lord and they followed him. God uses imperfect people to accomplish his will as long as you fear him and put him first. And to me, that's what's going on with this story. Yes, sir. Uh uh. If you give them a little shame and they deal with it, and then you get add to it and they deal with it a little bit more until there gets a point where they want to start fighting, yeah. but it's too late. Yeah. And I was kind of seeing the parallel, you know, because here he said, okay, well, if I can't get the midwives to do it, I'm just going to have my people. Yeah, they'll do it. Have to fall in. Yes. And so, or else. Yes. Exactly. Yes, sir. Keep chasing. That's all we got time for. Chase away. Yes. I mean, that was, a, it, that was not going to affect anything that day, that month, even that year, right? They were already that number. He's just trying to secure his future as the king is what's going on there. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time I have. I'll give you just this. So we talked about what, it, what you need to do is fear the Lord, put him first, Keep that in mind as Brent goes into chapter 2. That's a little different. Sorry, brother. Goes into 2 and, and looks at what the Lord does to people that fear him in chapter, or fear him and follow him, put him first in chapter 2. All right. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.